Welcome. My name is Carrie Dunley, and I'm the director of the Chapel Hill Analytical and Nanofabrication Lab, or CHANNEL, at UNC. Today, we will be talking about scanning electron microscopy, often called SEM, and environmental scanning electron microscopy, often called ESEM. The SEM and ESEM are microscopes that produce images using electrons instead of visible light. Remember, the wavelength of light limits the resolution in an optical microscope. Today, we're going to learn about using electrons, which have a much shorter wavelength than visible light, for imaging purposes. This is a diagram of a light microscope. The basic components include a light source, a way to focus that light onto the sample, a way to collect the light that travels through the sample, and a way to detect that light. With a light microscope, glass lenses similar to magnifying glasses are used to focus the light and collect the light. An electron microscope has many of the same components as a light microscope. Instead of a light source, the electron microscope uses an electron gun to produce electrons. Electromagnetic lenses are used to focus the electrons, and the detector is sensitive to electrons instead of visible light. Electrons can interact with a sample in a number of ways. Today, we will focus on the backscattered and secondary electrons that we can detect in an electron microscope. When an electron beam strikes a sample, some of the electrons are absorbed. Other electrons are backscattered, and some sample electrons can be ejected as secondary electrons. If the number of electrons that strike the sample is not equal to the number of electrons that leave the sample, then the sample will build up a charge. This is called charging, and it negatively affects the quality of the resulting image. In order to prevent charging, many SEM samples are coated with a thin layer of metal. Most SEM images are produced by collecting secondary electrons. This image is a secondary electron image of zinc oxide nanowires and nanoflowers. Secondary electron images show the surface features of a sample and therefore look very three-dimensional. The scale bar at the bottom right of the image indicates that most of these nanowires are a few microns long and only 50 to 100 nanometers wide. This is another secondary electron image showing cells that were cultured on top of manufactured pillars. Notice that the scale bar for this image is much larger than the previous image. Scanning electron microscopes can typically image features as small as 1 or 2 nanometers and as large as 1 or 2 millimeters. Backscatter SEM images show fewer surface features than secondary electron images. Often, backscatter images look very flat. The contrast that we do see in a backscattered image is due to differences in average atomic number. Regions of the sample with higher atomic number will produce more backscattered electrons and appear bright. This image is of a polymer sam sample with barium titanate particles embedded in it. Since the barium titanate has a much higher average atomic number, these particles appear much brighter than the polymer that they are embedded in. Many electron microscopes have both secondary and backscatter electron detectors, and acquiring both images on the same sample can illustrate the differences between them. This sample is a polymer resin circuit board with some soldered connections. The secondary electron image on the left shows the surface topology, while the backscattered image on the right shows the atomic number contrast. It is clear that the bright regions are from the higher atomic number solder, which is composed primarily of tin. Both types of images provide useful information. In a typical SEM, vacuum is required because the electrons that we use for imaging will scatter off gas molecules and prevent us from focusing the electron beam on the sample. As a result, we can only image dry samples in a typical SEM. If we want to look at wet samples, we need to dry them out first, and this often distorts their shape. This image shows how there are very few residual gas molecules in the SEM chamber of a traditional SEM, and the beam spot on the samples 
is relatively small. An environmental SEM, often called an ESEM, allows the operator to introduce a controllable amount of water vapor into the SEM vacuum chamber. There is one disadvantage of using an environmental SEM. When you introduce water molecules into the chamber, the electrons that are traveling towards the sample will hit these water molecules and scatter. The result is that the electron beam is not as tightly focused as in a traditional low pressure SEM. Thus, the resolution of the images is not as good. The main advantage of an ESEM is that you can image wet samples without having to dry them out. These include many types of biological samples, such as cells, bacteria, and plants. In the ESEM, we can keep these samples hydrated and image them in their natural state. In addition, we can use a small amount of water vapor to also prevent charging. This allows us to image non-conductive samples without the need for a conductive coating. This is an ESEM image of a bacterial biofilm. The bacteria are the rod-shaped particles that are about one micron long. The ESEM is great for imaging these types of wet samples. Thank you for joining this discussion of scanning electron microscopy and environmental scanning electron microscopy. Welcome, I'm Carrie Donnelly, the director of the Chapel Hill Analytical and Nanofabrication Lab, or CHANNEL, at UNC. With me today is Catherine McInnes, a graduate student at UNC. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. Today I'm going to show you how to prepare samples for scanning electron microscopy, or SEM. Let's head to the lab. Welcome to the SEM lab. Today we will be imaging some salt crystals. The tools that we will need to prepare our sample for imaging today include the sample, tweezers, sample stubs, conductive tape, two common types are carbon tape and copper tape, and possibly a sputter coater. First, I'll mount the sample onto a sample stub with some conductive tape. The tape I'm using is double-sided carbon tape and I'll use it to hold the salt in place. By gently tapping the sample stub on the table, I can remove any excess salt that is not well attached. Samples that are not conductive need to be coated with a conductive coating for traditional SEM imaging in order to prevent charging problems. Our lab uses a sputter coater to deposit a thin layer of gold palladium, but some labs use a carbon coating instead. I'll place the sample in the sputter coater. The metal that we will deposit is actually held in the lid, and this small circular disc just next to the sample is called a quartz crystal microbalance. It can measure how much material has been deposited. After loading the sample into the chamber and closing the lid, I can evacuate the chamber using a vacuum pump. Once the chamber has been evacuated, I can start the deposition. A plasma is generated that removes material from the gold palladium target and deposits it everywhere in the chamber, including on my sample. It's easier to see this plasma if we turn off the lights. The readout from the quartz crystal microbalance lets me know how much material has been deposited. A two nanometer coating is usually sufficient to prevent charging. If your sample is conductive or if you will be imaging in an environmental SEM, you can skip this sample coating step. Our sample is now ready for SEM imaging. Let's head to the imaging lab. <laughs> 
Hello, I'm Carrie Donnelly, the director of the Chapel Hill Analytical and Nanofabrication Lab, or CHANNEL, at UNC. With me today is Catherine McInnes, a graduate student at UNC. In this section, we will show you how to image a sample with scanning electron microscopy, or SEM, and environmental scanning electron microscopy, or ESEM. I prepared our salt sample for imaging, and now I'm ready to look at it with the SEM. Welcome to the SEM lab. This is the SEM that we will be using today. It can operate in three different modes, high vacuum, low vacuum, and environmental SEM mode. We will image in all three modes today. Remember the SEM operates under vacuum, so first I will vent the chamber to atmosphere and then load the sample. The sample stub has a small post that fits into the sample stage. A small set screw holds the sample in place. I'm also going to load a similar salt sample that hasn't been coated with any metal so we can compare the effect of the metal coating on imaging. Most systems take just a minute or two before they are pumped down to a low enough pressure to start imaging. I'll start by imaging in high vacuum mode. This is the standard operating mode for most SEMs. The first thing to do when starting to image is to focus the electron beam on the sample. I will also adjust the stigmation to make sure that I'm imaging with a round beam of electrons and not an ellipse, and make sure my imaging conditions are optimized. Once these things are done, it is pretty easy to move around on the sample and zoom in or zoom out. The scale bar at the bottom right of the image lets me know how big the features in my sample are. These particles are on the order of hundreds of microns. This sample is traditional table salt, and you can see from this image I collected that it crystallizes into nice square crystals. Common table salt is sodium chloride, and its crystal structure is face-centered cubic, as shown here. It's easy to see how the arrangement of atoms in sodium chloride results in the small cubes that we see by SEM imaging. Now let's move to the uncoated salt crystals. This image of the uncoated salt shows some streaks and some bright and dark spots that don't quite look right. This is the charging effect that we discussed earlier. Because the sample is not conductive, it is building up a charge and this makes it very difficult to image it properly with a charged beam of electrons. It would be impossible to collect a good image under these conditions. Now we're going to switch to low vacuum mode and continue to image the uncoated salt sample. Remember that in low vacuum mode, we introduce some water vapor in the chamber that will help prevent charging. This is the same area of the sample we were just looking at, and you can see that now I can collect a much nicer image than I could in high vacuum mode. Let's now operate the system in environmental SEM mode. For this, we'll need to use a different sample stage that is capable of cooling the sample and a slightly different sample holder in which I can put some uncoated salt crystals. Once the system has pumped down to the pressure that we'll image at, we can start to adjust the humidity level in the chamber. You can see that at some point, the chamber becomes humid enough to start forming water droplets on the salt crystals. If I let the water continue to form on the sample, the salt crystal will eventually dissolve into the water. I can force the salt to recrystallize by reducing the humidity in the chamber and allowing the water to evaporate. Once it does, the salt will form crystals again. All of the imaging I've done so far has all been with a secondary electron detector. If I switch to the backscatter detector, it's clear that the contrast mechanism is different. These two images are of the same salt crystals, but with two different detectors. The one on the left is a typical secondary electron image showing the surface topology. The image on the right is a backscatter image which shows more atomic number contrast. The salt crystals become relatively dark because sodium and chlorine have lower atomic numbers than the metal sample holder that they are sitting in. This image is also much flatter looking than the secondary electron image. Thank you for joining us for this demonstration of SEM and ESEM imaging. Today, we image coated and uncoated salt samples in high vacuum mode and saw charging on the uncoated sample. We successfully used low vacuum mode to eliminate charging.
In ESIM mode, we increase the humidity enough to form water droplets that could dissolve the salt and then decrease the humidity in the chamber and saw the salt recrystallize. Finally, we saw the difference between images obtained with a secondary electron detector and a backscatter electron detector.